uh, debate uh, developed. My goodness, are you an atheist? Like, namely, Warren McGrew. And I believe we handled things extremely well. Who has a, a web channel called The Idol Killer. Why are you running? Where did you go? You're scared. This is Michael Beverly. Thank you for joining my channel. Um, instead of doing my normal pre-recorded intro, I'm just going to fly off the cuff here. This is Faithful Friday's Divided Devotion. It's a series I do about highlighting the arguments, the disagreements, the accusations, and the strife in Christendom that seems to me to prove that God did not answer Jesus' prayer in the upper room, John 17, the high priestly prayer, where Jesus said, Father, make them unified like you and I are unified so that the world will know you sent me. I take Jesus at his word. He was not sent by God. I think your options are Judaism or atheism. Christianity is obviously false. Let's hear Christians bash each other, argue, and call each other atheists. You're scared. Right, and I, and I should be clear on this, by the way. I'm not just saying that open theism is wrong when I call it heresy. There's a difference between heresy and arch heresy, or what we might call damnable heresy. Okay. When I'm referring to open theism as heresy, I am referring to it as something that is utterly and entirely not Christian. Okay, so what is open theism if you've never been introduced to this? It's kind of like the argument between Robert Sapolsky and Daniel Dennett, right? So if you're not familiar with that, the Robert Sapolsky just came out with a book recently on why we why free will is an illusion. We don't have free will. I hope I'm hoping giving justice to what his argument is. Um, I listened to him on Lawrence, Lawrence Krauss's podcast. This was no easy task. In fact, it's probably this, this was one of the hardest things I've had to do for many reasons. I want to talk about your new book, your book determined about free will. One of the hardest things for me, it was not an easy task to, to work through it for a variety of reasons. There's a lot there first, but also I come into this with the absolute conviction from everything I know saying there's no such thing as free will. So it was hard for me, to, you know, accepting this fact. I thought, well, why? <laughs> I'm, I, I, given that I don't, you know, think there's free will, why am I really motivated to go through this? And, right. and that was hard at the beginning. And a lot of what he says makes sense, but a lot of what he says, I kick back against the same way. I suspect Daniel Dennett does, even though I haven't listened to his arguments. I have listened to a little bit of Sam Harris on this. Well, that was silly of me. Let's just, I don't want to take a lot of time on this, but let's just listen to a little clip of Daniel Dennett so we can kind of see where the two positions are coming from. Robert makes one big mistake, and it's right at the center of his work. He wants to... In fact, it's a sort of version of the of the mammals paradox. <laughs> he says, "You're not making a free choice uh, because every act you perform depends on things that happened earlier and happened earlier and happened earlier." And we go back to the Big Bang, and determinism is true, and so you can't make a free choice. And what he's missed is the difference between control and causation. Let me illustrate that with an example. There's an earthquake and a boulder starts to roll down one of the Rocky Mountains. Bouncy, 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 down it goes. Okay. It's caused to roll down the mountain by gravity, wind pressure, bumps sure. on the way, material, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Now, if we rewound the tape of life, right to the, you know, and replayed that exact circumstance, it would roll in exactly the same way. That's determinism. But if we don't get it exactly right, then the, who knows? In fact, the, the path of the rock is uncontrolled. It's, but the only way you can tell it's uncontrolled is by varying the circumstances and seeing whether the behavior is varied. Now, compare that with a, with a really good skier. She's a, she's a downhill specialist, and she skis down the mountain. We want to know if that's controlled or not. 
Well, have her run down again and again and again. Have her do 10 runs. She'll end up crossing the finish line in all of those cases in almost exactly the same amount of time. Very reliable result. That's control. Now, if she goes out of control, she becomes more like the boulder. Now, the path of the boulder is determined. The path of the skier is determined. Mm -hmm. But the difference is that the skier's path is controlled and the rock's path is not. The rock's path is like a coin flip. Coin flips, we call them random for good reason, because they're not predictable and they're not controllable. That's the key. But they're determined. If deter you can't prove that determinism is false by flipping coins. Yeah. <laughs> Ridiculous. And you can't prove that determinism is false by saying, look, evolution depends on random variation and, and mutation, because the randomness of evolution isn't quantum randomness. It's physical chaotic randomness. It's deterministic randomness, if you like. So if you make the distinction between control and causation, then Sapolsky's argument simply falls apart because it doesn't go back to the Big Bang because once life gets started, you start making, what life does is it generates controllers. It generates self-controlled little agents, things that are alive. And they're alive because their parts are better suited for reproduction than the other variants. That's, that's the whole key to evolution, right? And I kick back to Sam Harris's argument as well. I tend to, I tend to land on compatibilism. If you're not sure what that means, it just is sort of a fancy way of saying that you have some free will, like you have some deter, you can determine some of your own fate. It's not completely determined by natural events. Like, in other words, everything you're going to do in your life, including what you're going to have for lunch tomorrow, is not predetermined from the point of the Big Bang till, and there's nothing you can do about it. It's just everything you're going to do set in motion. So, atheists have this debate, and so do Christians. Greg Boyd. Who is a pastor and a and, and a best-selling author wrote this book called you know the God of God of the Possible. So in God of the Possible, he explains this open view of God, the open theist view, and it made a lot of sense to me. Now, now somebody might latch onto that and say, oh, well, you know, while you were getting to this point point of deconstructing, you read Greg Boyd's book and you became an atheist. See, see that Boyd is leading people away from Christ, but that's not true. Now, I talked to my pastor just briefly about this book, and he said, you need to be very careful. That's heresy. And I'm like, okay, well, it makes sense to me. Of all the theodicy out there in the world, this argument that Boyd makes in his book makes the most sense to me. So if anything, Boyd was a roadblock to atheism for me, and if I was going to be a Christian, if I had stayed a Christian, it would have been because of Boyd's work, not in spite of Boyd's work. And the reason is, is Boyd makes a very elegant and very logical argument that if the future doesn't exist yet, like the same way a square circle doesn't exist or a monkey typing on a typewriter. So this is the thing he gives in the book. He says, What's the monkey on the typewriter typing right now? The red monkey is typing a novel. Look to your left. Well, there's no monkey typing a typewriter there. It doesn't exist. Well, can God know what the, what the ending of this novel is? The monkey's typing? Doesn't God know everything? Open theists simply believe that when God created the world, he created it with possibilities, unresolved possibilities. And to the degree that the world consists of unresolved possibilities, then the fact that God knows is that uh, it may go this way or that way. So it's really just the belief that possibilities are real. God created a world in which the future is to some degree open. The reason this theodicy works so well is because it make, it lets God off the hook for all the bad shit. Because you can say, look, God didn't want you to be mugged. And had you maybe had you prayed more or maybe had you listened to that 
inner voice, you wouldn't have gone down that dark alley at three in the morning. And you probably even said to yourself, I probably shouldn't go down this alley, but you, you know, you dismissed your gut feeling. And now you realize that was the Holy Spirit. And, but God didn't intervene on your free will. He let you go down the alley and make that bad choice and you got mugged. It wasn't God's fault. It was your fault for not listening to your own voice, your own intuition, and the Holy Spirit telling you not to do it. You have now, the, the counter argument to that, of course, is, uh-oh, that means God doesn't know everything. And now that's heresy because the nature of God is to know everything. Well, okay, but does he know how to make a square circle? Well, well, no, because that's a logical impossibility. Well, maybe knowing the future is also a logic, a logical impossibility because it doesn't exist yet. When I'm referring to open theism as heresy, I am referring to it as something that is utterly and entirely not Christian. Open theism is going to be, it's going to be, my prediction is, a bigger and bigger issue for us to cover in the church because the online world is now governing the discussions. Yes, the online world has changed the nature of religion and politics and communication and ideas and information and guess what in a world of information of free thought and free information christianity loses sorry mike you're on the wrong side i've got friends who are open theists i've got friends who are open theists sounds a little bit like I have friends who are black. I have friends who are gay. I got friends that are Mexican. Wait, I got friends that are Mexican and gay. Wait, wait, I have friends that are black, gay, and like sushi. Okay, what what did you I'm say, Dio? Oh who, who made this fucking order? <laughs> who made this fucking order? Jesus. Woo! We need more people to eat our sushi. <laughs> Fuck. Let me. Why don't we have more friends? I've got friends who are open theists. I have often said, and I want to see if you agree with me on this because I haven't heard your stuff on open theism yet. Um, I have often said that I think that the open theists are making basically the same mistakes as our deterministic friends are. And, and, and by concluding, now they're both going in different directions, but they yep. both conclude that if God foreknows a choice, then it, it must be determined. Okay, what he just said there, the, he said the mistake that people are making on both sides is that if, if God foreknows a choice, it must be determined. Now, Christians say God exists outside of time. So this line is when time starts. This is the Big Bang. So here is God. Now, I know God doesn't have a body. He's immaterial and he's timeless, but I got to represent God somehow. So this is God. Oh, put a crown on his head. Okay, God has a crown. God is, okay. So this line, remember, is the Big Bang, the universe. Now, if you listen to somebody, and I've heard William Craig make, William Lane Craig make this argument that the universe had to come into existence so that it always existed, even though God created it. Now, it's, it's weird. It, it seems to me to be a paradox, but here's why William Craig and others it, and if I'm, if I don't have it right, what William Craig, William Lane Craig says, forgive me, don't, don't. Somebody else said this if it wasn't him, but I think this is how he explains it. Okay, so here's the Big Bang, and time starts, right? So, so time is going this way, and here is you, my Christian friend. Here is you getting saved. Hallelujah. Right here is you as a sinner. Okay, here is you getting saved. And then here is you when you passed away. And here is you in heaven. Sorry, I put this way over on the side. You're happy. Okay, so, you know, here is your great great ancestor who is a monkey. Or here is Adam and Eve. If you believe in creationism, it doesn't matter. They're just at a point in time. Now, God, God, it doesn't exist in time, right? And so, what, what, the enemies of open theism, Mike Winger and others, say is that 
all of this information, so so you getting saved here, God knew here before time started. Remember, t equals zero right here. Sorry, this is a crap, crappy drawing, but you get the point. This is t equals zero, right? This is six thousand years to to you know here, or you know, or fourteen point three billion doesn't matter. So God over here. Uh, so the Calvinists say, look, when you get when you get saved here, God knew. God was God was happy, saved. He knew you'd be saved. And you're saved from all time. You were saved. You were saved not here. You were saved in God's mind here at the beginning. Now, what they're saying is that just because God knew you were going to get saved didn't mean that he determined it. But here's the problem. If God is outside of time, how did God get to... How, God didn't cross time to get to time equals zero for the universe, right? There, this this can't happen. There can't be time. So all of this had to be in God's mind and his brain always. And the point being, if if the information is in God's mind before t equals zero, then how can you do anything other than be saved? And that's the term. And if you're an atheist and you believe you don't have any free will, it's kind of the same thing. The Big Bang happens, and whether you became a Christian or an atheist, or whether you died and got hit by a bus on October 17th, or you lived to your 90, it was all determined. Now, that so that's the crux of the argument. And therefore, yep. the open theist says, "Well, God doesn't foreknow our choices." Then, and definitely the, the agree determinists with that. say, "Well, He determines our choices, and we just got to deal with it." Yeah, um, they they hit the same fork in the road. Okay, so these guys are saying the Calvinists are wrong. That just because God knew you were saved didn't mean He chose you. You still had free will to choose to be saved. And the Open theists say, wait a second, if God knows all that stuff, it's determined. So God doesn't know the future. You know, he wants you to be saved. He loves you. He sent Jesus to save, you know, to, to be the payment for your sin. Because like he knew you were, so this is, how, this is the open theist position. God knew you were going to sin because he's God. But he didn't know every sin you were going to do because he gave you free will and it happened in the future. Right. One goes left, one goes right. right. But what, <laughs> and the fork is the belief that God's foreknowledge is determinism. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. If he if he knows what's going to happen, then it must be already set or fixed, and therefore determined by the yeah, one who and, knows it. And that that's uh, I think a modal fallacy, which we can get into. Okay, we're not going to determine what's the truth here about that any more than anyone else is going to figure out what the truth is. We may never know. What's the point of my videos on Friday, though, is is the contrast. So in the in the atheist or skeptic community, people might think that Daniel Dennett is just crazy and Daniel Dennett is just wrong. But you're not going to catch Lawrence Krauss saying, I think Daniel Dennett's going to hell. He, he's not a, you know, he's our, you know, th that he's. He's not a real atheist. Now think of how stupid this this is that that Christians preach a loving God and out of the same breath out of their mouth they will also say if you if you believe the things Greg Boyd teaches you're not even a Christian and you're going to go to hell. Do you treat open theist just as much as brothers as you treat deterministic Calvinists? Okay, so here's how I handle this. <laughs> um, <clears throat> in my studies of open theism, I've mostly focused on, is it biblical? Like, are there, what are the biblical, like, proof texts for open theism? What are the ones opposed to it? That's what I've focused on. I've also spent a little time on the philosophy of it and the idea right. of necessity versus certainty um, and how those are different concepts, and that's too much to unpack at the moment. Right, but right. those are the things I've focused on. Um, now, zooming out, does open theism inherently like 
conflict with Christianity. Um, I think that there's a version of open theism where you can still be a Christian. I don't know, Mike. I I just don't like this gatekeeping gatekeeping stuff. But wh- whatever, it doesn't matter. But the, it it's interesting though. So Allah means God, right? So if 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 somebody comes along and says, "I'm a Muslim," do are they? Are, do you actually think that they're, um, like, are are they are Muslims actually atheists to you, Mike Winger, and other people? Because Allah, in your mind, even though it's God, doesn't exist. Or, or are the other way to ask this question: If a young child, say a five year old child, or a little kid is raised Muslim and they're praying to Allah. And all, again, Allah just means God. Does God ignore them because their parents are Muslim? Like, are you holding the five-year-old accountable to know the right God? And at this, you could say the same thing about, uh, say, a Mormon or anyone else that you think is, you know, a, a hardcore open theist has a child and that child is four, five, six years old, seven, eight, nine, ten. When does that kid, when is that kid going to hell? Like when does, when does Jesus quit answering that kid's prayers? Like do they have to make a, you know, they have to reach some age of accountability, I guess, where God says, whoa, yesterday I was answering you, but now, now you should know that I don't go by Allah or I don't go by God under the open theist or you know you're 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 now accountable to be a Mormon so sorry Jesus ain't open in your mail no more now just to be honest I want to give a little bit of just honesty here and let's keep it real atheists tend to have the same argument with a few things like my girlfriend it gets so twisted about this so I sucked a couple dicks and I still claim I'm straight can I, am I really straight or did those couple of dicks make me gay? Some people say I'm bisexual because of that. I think everybody's bisexual and that's kind of the irony here. Everybody's, every theist has a different version of, it's on a spectrum, just like sexuality. And if there, if there is a real God, None of you all know how close you are to the real God or how close you are to the fake made up God in your own head. So I, you know, I, I don't know, dudes, this is actually funny. Like I, I, when I thought of doing this series a while back, I thought, you know, I'll never run out of, excuse me, I'll never run out of material. And I won't, although it, it, it'll it start getting into micro niches of belief. But it brought up an interesting point. If, if you believe that there's a line, and it sounds like every one of these guys believe there's a line, where if you cross it, you're not a Christian anymore because you have the wrong God. And And I've said this before, I'll say it again. The, do- the, the doctrine of who is a real Christian is, is a doctrine itself. In other words, there's a doctrine about how to figure out the doctrine. And so some doctrine is, well, you got to believe in the Trinity. You got to believe Jesus bodily resurrected and that he was fully man and fully God. And you got to you gotta be- not just believe it, but you have to accept Jesus as, you know, like your Lord and Savior or something, or you have to accept that. And then some people start adding stuff. Well, you also have to be baptized, or you also have to, you know, the whatever. What and you also can't be an open theist, according to some of these guys. And then you're going to hell because you're not a real Christian. Jesus, y- you guys should listen to yourself. It's actually funny. I mean, it's tragic, but it's also funny. Right. Because you could you could even say God just chooses to not know what'll happen. Yeah. Which and I don't about. agree. I don't agree with that. Yeah. But I wouldn't call it apostate. I, I wouldn't call yeah. it that. Then there's another version of open theism where you're really calling into question 
some of God's very attributes. And I start to, it just starts to raise really serious question marks in my mind. Well, when I'm in doubt like that, I I tend to treat people like they're Christians because I'd rather be a little too gracious than not. The mental gymnastics you have to do to be a Christian like Mike Winger. I tend to treat them like they're Christians because, you know, I don't have all the evidence, I guess. Now, in, in Romans where it says, you know, therefore there is now no condemnation who are in Christ Jesus. What, what Mike is saying is if someone's a Christian, they're not condemned, they're saved. But he can't be perfectly clear, so he's going he's gonna to err on the side of being merc- merciful and graceful and treat them like they're Christians. So, here, so here's an interesting thing. Let's say, let's say Mike Winger is being gracious and nice to some supposed maybe Christian, having lunch together, and Mike really likes the guy. And he's explaining to the guy why, you know, he, he thinks open theism is wrong. And the guy's explaining why he thinks it's right. And bam, a bus smashes into Starbucks and kills them both. Now, Mike likes this guy. Mike, Mike thought he was a, he's a good dude. And, and the guy confessed Jesus is Lord. He loves Jesus. The, the guy's been serving in the, in the church and serving in ministry trips and, and, you know, praying for the sick and doing all the stuff Christians do. And, and Mike acknowledged that. He's just not sure about this open theism. There, there they are in front of St. Peter. And, and St. Peter says, uh, yo, no, uh, sorry, Mike, but that guy's being sent to hell. Step, step away from him. And Mike's like, whoa, I thought, I, you know, I was treating him graciously, kind of like he was a Christian. And St. Peter says, yeah, I know. It's easy to make that mistake as a human, but we can see in his heart and we know his open theism put some, you know, put some definitions on God that aren't true. So, yeah, you know what? There he goes. Whoa, that happens fast when that happens. So imagine you're Mike Winger in that position. It's like, Praise Jesus, that guy went to hell. I mean, if you do that, you're the, you're no different from a Calvinist. It's just dirty. Like, wouldn't you want that guy to go to heaven? He loved Jesus. He served Jesus. But he wasn't he wasn't a real Christian. I mean, as much as I hate Calvinism, that I mean, that theology is just nasty. Listen to some Christians talk about it. Holy smokes, you you would think. You would actually think I was the Christian and they were the atheist. When I'm referring to open theism as heresy, I am referring to it as something that is utterly and entirely not Christian. And that he cannot know tense propositions. God does not know that we are having this discussion. He doesn't know Warren and Chris and Marlon and Vocab and Merrick are discussing this. Hold on, Warren, he doesn't can know I tell that. him real quick? Hey, yo, God! Having a discussion on open theism, Marlon's channel, cool. Does he know now? In our view, he, he does know. Well, he but in your view, no. he doesn't. Yeah, in our view, he does know, but in your view, he doesn't. So to say that our view limits God's knowledge is to is to be disingenuous with your own position, which does limit God's knowledge. He doesn't know what time it is. We affirm divine cognition. I mean, like God, God actually is intelligent. He knows things. And it's not because he is eternally the source and some ethereal fate machine that's necessitating all of this to be an outflowing. But the other point is biblical omniscience is defined as God being all seeing. It's all seeing. It's not eternally decreeing and manifesting in time. It is all seeing. And so when we're talking about what is biblical omniscience, that's whenever our position wins. Whenever we get into the, having to point out the philosophical problems of your position, you'll say, well, I don't believe that. And we'll quote a scholar and you'll say, well, I disagree with him. Why are you going there? But when we go to the scripture, we see that the biblical omniscience is a dynamic omniscience. It is a living, free, relational, responsive, all-seeing omniscience. That's biblical omniscience. God knows all the facts. What the classical theist is doing is begging the question for an exhaustively settled, eternally faded future. We're saying not so. God is not faded to, to tomorrow to, to have to respond in a particular way. He is relational. He can, he can respond however he wants. He's free. The future is not faded. We're not faded. God's not faded. And I believe we handled things extremely well. I really appreciate Chris being there as he was a great counterbalance for me. 
I appreciate Marlon for putting this together and allowing us another opportunity just to show folks why God is free and living and has dynamic omniscience if the Bible is to be believed. Well, this is what you all say. I believe the Bible, and if you interpret it right, you'll get the right God. And by the way, my interpretation is the right one. Reason, 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 logic. Obviously, obviously I've got it right. Come on. If any one of your gods is the right God, he's a real asshole. Why didn't he make this shit clear? You ought to throw up your hands and just say, it's obvious that smart people disagree on this subject. So trying to argue about who's right and who's going to hell is just an exercise in being an asshole. And just stop. It's huge. So huge. So let me say, yeah. So what we're talking about here is like God existing all alone prior to the existence of the created universe. And that's the classical position of creation ex nihilo. That's what open theists today say about creation ex nihilo. So that's something everyone agrees on. Uh, there's this actual prior state of affairs where God exists all alone without any created thing. And then from there, what the Calvinists and the Molinists do is they start carving up God's life into distinct logical moments. And so I want people to notice something very important here. So at the moment of natural knowledge, God only knows what could happen if he were to create. So at this logical moment, God does not know what will happen because God does not even know if he himself will create anything at all. So as Calvinists like Terence Thiessen and Molinists like Thomas Flint, as they make very clear, at this logical moment, there are not even any true counterfactuals of divine freedom. And you might ask, why? Well, because the future is alethically open at the first logical moment of God's life. Well, it seems like this is where the paradox comes into play. If God hadn't decided something about creation yet, as soon as you use the word yet, you're putting God in time. If you're saying God existed forever, but he's outside time, then he could never get to the point of deciding because deciding is also a function of time. How did God decide to create to create the universe? He couldn't if he was outside time. He can't get past affinity. He's it would be infinity till he got to that point to make the decision. So that doesn't make any. That seems to make create a, a paradox. So that's why I think, and I I'm not sure if it's William Lane Craig, but I think so. But maybe somebody else explain that the universe has always existed. It's just God created it and and God always existed. I, I, again, again, it's another weird paradox, which you're forced to do when you start trying to make sense of all this stuff. Now, it seems the open theist position is simply that, you know, whatever was happening with God before the Big Bang, he, you know, he decided, boom, make the Big Bang. And then God at that point was subjected to time in the, in the universe, like maybe not outside the universe because he's timeless and he's going to exist forever. But but the universe itself, God has not yet determined to create at all, nor has God determined that any particular timeline should come about. In other words, there is no fact of the matter about what God will do at the first logical moment of natural knowledge. So facts about what God will freely do are contingent facts and thus fall outside of the scope of natural knowledge, which only covers necessary facts. And that is, well, I mean, it's going to be shocking for people whose only knowledge of Calvinism is just the internet. And if it... So so the universe itself, and and I, I want to clarify something. So when, when, when somebody says the universe always existed, it's a sort of a paradox. So... There's a word for this. I, I don't remember what it was. But when I heard who I, I think was William Lane Craig explain this, but it, like I said, could be somebody else. There's, they were saying that the Big Bang happens and time starts and God's not subject to time. He's outside time. So he boom starts. But because they recognize that God, if, 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 it, if infinity exists, th then God like can never make a decision to make this. This like it can't be like da 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 da. God's hanging out. Hey, I'm kind of bored. Let's let's make let's 
let's decide to make the universe bam it's because that would put god over here into time so in that sense god god made sustains created the universe as well as time you know time in the beginning that there be light etc is time matter and energy god speaks us into existence but it happens in a way that doesn't create the paradox of God being outside time and never being able to get to that point. Now, what's interesting to me is this, this clip seems to be arguing that God was subject to time before he created the universe, which, which, okay. And that God had a start to his, the natural start to his thoughts. Now, of course, as an atheist, all this stuff is arguing about how many um, angels can dance on the head of a pin kind of argument. It's like, yeah, okay, it's just it's interesting philosophy. But what what I like about it is how it it dovetails into the same arguments that atheists and you know natural materialists have about free will, libertarian free will, to no free will at all, to some something in between, some sort of com combatalism or some some form of free will like everybody like i don't think anyone argues that we existed in a way before we were born in which we like negotiated with god or picked our parents or our culture or the time we'd be born right i mean maybe somebody does and I, it certainly seems possible in in the realm of possibilities that that our if our souls are so if our souls are immaterial and also they the, our souls wouldn't be subject to time they're immaterial and you could argue that our from god's perspective our souls existed at the moment of the big bang because he knew us so that's where the crux of the argument is when when the, when the universe starts the the not, the people that oppose open theism basically say God knows everything. This is like the position Mike Winger is arguing. God is all-knowing. He knows everything. But just because God knows you're going to have a tuna sandwich tomorrow doesn't mean he determined it. You still had libertarian free will to have a tuna sandwich over a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And the Calvinist position, at least how they're criticized, is you guys are making God out to be... Um, this being that determined everything, like not just who goes to heaven and who goes to hell, but but that but that God chose for you to have a peanut butter sandwich or a tuna sandwich instead at from the beginning of time, i.e. t equals zero point Planck unit back in the Big Bang. So all sides have paradoxes, and that's the thing that's kind of funny to me. Every, then he couldn't. Uh, be certain about everything that's going to be happen, but if he is indeed endowed us with free will, then that isn't the case. Why would God take such a chance? Well, that's that's a long story. We can go into that if we want to, but but we believe that he has, uh, he has endowed us with free will, and so again, in in for many respects, the future simply is undecided. Now, God is perfect in knowledge, but that doesn't mean that God knows as definite something which in reality is indefinite, okay? I mean, that, that would be uh, contradictory. So if there really are alternative possibilities for the future, different ways that the future really can turn out, then God who is perfect in knowledge knows that. To be permitting, what? The free will choice of creatures or his decree? Which one? This, this is the problem. When you have a worldview that says God decrees whatsoever comes to pass, then what is it that God is permitting and or restraining? We'll hear Calvinists all the time talk about God permits this, restrains that. Okay, What is it he's permitting and or restraining if not his own decree? If you say permission or if you say he's restraining something, it is presuming libertarian freedom of the will because that is what he's permitting and or restraining. He's restraining Satan, who is acting independently of himself, of, of God. He's restraining Satan from doing what Satan wants to do freely. He's restraining Jonah from going to Tarsus. 
he's restraining uh, Abimelech from sleeping with Sarah. Okay, he's restraining that from happening. Why? Because he decreed them to do it and only to step in and restrain them from doing what he decreed for them to do? Okay, so in other words, if you use the vocabulary of provisionists, Arminians, non-Calvinists of all sorts, and you're making statements like God permits this thing to happen, then you seem to be presuming that he's permitting something outside of himself. Otherwise, you've got him permitting himself. And that makes no rational sense at all. Okay, so this this guy is uh, Leighton Flowers, who was the, with the Mike Winger clip earlier in this video. He was the one talking to Mike Winger. And Flowers, so, okay, so it's sol solitology. Um, I can't even pronounce that word. Soteriology? Soteriology? Yeah, whatever. Um, Dr. Leighton Flowers. So he here. Okay. So I want to just, I want to just play that one part of that clip. Bear with me for just like a three seconds. And that makes no rational sense at all. And that makes no rational sense at all. And that makes no rational sense at all. <laughs> and that makes no rational sense at all. To hear that come out of a Christian's mouth is just funny. That makes no rational sense. <laughs> really? <laughs> wow! It, make, it, make, it makes no rational sense? So the, the, the funny thing is how much some of us all agree with each other whenever we're fighting against Calvinists or, you know, the, the, the Calvinist and these guys, the, the Calvinist haters against Greg Boyd and the open theist people like they're wrong now, on a serious note let can we talk seriously can we talk like grown-ups if God gave everybody libertarian free will and everybody in these debates that's that's educated and, and we all agree smart like come on you're not gonna say Greg Boyd is stupid right and late Leighton Flowers, he's got a doctor in front of his name. I'm assuming he's reasonably intelligent. Uh, Idol Killer Warren seems like a smart guy. I hope people at least give me some credit of having at least a reasonable level of IQ and knowledge and ability to process information. Like, I'm not stupid. I don't think Mike Winger's stupid. I don't, you know, like, can we all agree that, like, we're not, we're not all dummies, right? So if we have libertarian free will... What is preventing all of us from agreeing on this stuff that's supposedly so obvious? Like, even if, like, you could even ask an atheist, you could, like, you could come to me and say, what, looking at the Bible, what do you think is most likely, like, if it was true? And my answer would be the most, in this argument, uh, Greg Boyd's argument makes the most sense to me. To me, that seems the most logically consistent with the idea of a good, of a good God that extends free will. But you know, he's fine with putting up fences, but he's not fine putting you locked in a cage where you have no choice but to have the tuna sandwich tomorrow because that's what God decreed and decided from the beginning of time. So I find that open theist position lot more logically tenable and and. And it makes sense to me. Does that mean it's true? Well, I mean, I'm an atheist. So I don't even believe in God. But if I did believe in a God, that would make the most sense to me. And if I was arbitrating this argument between these people, I would say, hey, that's that's where I land. Am I stupid? Am I blind? Maybe I lack the free will to actually think this through logically. I mean, maybe we, maybe none of us have free will. Maybe uh, Robert and Sam are right. And none of us have free will. And we're just all arguing like a bunch of, you know, or like a bunch of chickens or a bunch of pigeons squawking and are, now we know people change their mind. Like I used to be a Christian and I changed my mind. This guy, uh, Dr. Flowers used to be a Calvinist. According to his YouTube description, he used to be a Calvinist professor. Now he's got a whole YouTube ch channel dedicated to taking down Calvinism. Like it's bad. It's not biblical. And do we all have do we all have libertarian free will to make these choices? And if so, why are we so far apart? Like none of us, none of us are arguing that gravity doesn't exist. None of us, none of us are going to go on the tenth 
you know, the, to the 10th floor of a building and say, I've determined gravity doesn't exist and jump off the building because we all know, like, we don't argue about that. Yeah, we don't argue about basic facts about life. You know, like, you need, if you want to be healthy, you do some exercise, you need a good diet. If you want to go to Japan, you got to take a boat or an airplane. Uh, you know, there's, there's no magical way that we're aware of to get there, et cetera. Like, we agree on these basic things. We, we agree on basic chemistry and physics. And, you know, there's some argument in science on biology, obviously, but most rational people accept evolution happened and, and, and is happening. Evolution is a process that is continuing to happen. And, you know, we, we do accept the heliocentric solar system. It's been well demonstrated. We don't live on a flat earth. It's been well demonstrated, et cetera, et cetera. Why do we have these arguments about determinism, free will, and, you know, Calvinism and open theism and blah, 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 blah. Why? Again, we're not, we're not stupid. Do we have the free will to make a choice? And if so, why don't we all in general agree? Like, why don't atheists just see the obvious? And if you throw out, oh, we want to sin or we're just being rebellious, come on, grow the fuck up. Grow up. We've come to a we've come to a determination that the evidence that we see does not lead to the conclusion that a that a God exists. Oh, most of us say, most of us will say a God could exist but doesn't. Some say there's evidence enough to say there is no God for sure. It's a different argument. But you know, is is even if you hate Richard Dawkins, he's not. Come on, you can't say the man's stupid. Why doesn't Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris? Or, you know, I now I know you believe Christopher Hitchens now believes in God as he's burning in hell forever. And the Calvinists say God made him to burn in hell. Like he never had a choice to be saved because God determined. You see how silly this all gets? So, I don't know. I'm about to wrap this up, but I wanted to play one last clip from Dr. Flowers, if you'll bear with me. Um, and even open theist. Have, I would have an issue with this because they even acknowledge that God has enough foresight to know what possible things the people will do. And it is certainly when they're carrying their kids and tying them up and about to throw them in that, that, that window of time, even if it's only five or 10 minutes, God could step in and stop them from doing that and does not stop them from doing that. So even open theists have the quandary. If open theists think they're getting away from the quandary of why God permits sin to happen or moral evil to happen, they're not. They're just kicking the can down the road, so to speak. It doesn't really answer the quandary because in time, God could step in and stop something from happening if he chose to do so. And so the the, the free will theodicy, the, the problem of evil existing, exists even among open theists. Though. And I have to heartily agree. If your God exists in any of these forms, he's a fucking sadist. He's, he's malicious, mean, evil and cruel that that's just the fact you can argue word salad me to death you can argue why god loves us because he gave us free will that doesn't explain smallpox the bubonic plague our malaria our massive earthquakes is it a little child dies in a massive earthquake and you're going to say that was his libertarian free will or the libertarian free will of his parents or the libertarian free will of the engineers that didn't do a good job building the thing no god designed a world with earthquakes now you could say the the fall of man the sin of adam and eve caused the plague and the smallpox and the giant earthquakes you could say that your god's still a dick because he could have stopped it like we don't have bubonic plague we don't have whooping cough and polio and smallpox. Like we've developed vaccines. So are you trying to say, you know, hey, God just let us, you know, God didn't mind that all these millions of people suffered from uh, the plague and malaria and smallpox and whooping cough and polio, uh, you know, until vaccines were developed by smart men that God still gets the credit, by the way. Uh, come on. So. Yes, I agree with Dr. Flowers. Open theists aren't off the hook. In all of your situations, God is still a sadistic God. 
he gets off on pain. So the way around this is naturalism, because naturalism actually fits the model that we see. Like if we were gonna make a we were gonna make a model of naturalism, we would say we would for we we would read guys like Lawrence Krauss and Max Tegmark, and we say, okay, the universe seems to be a mathematical universe. And quantum particles seem to be self-existent. They just pop. And a universe could quote as 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 William Lane Craig likes to say, "You never see a bicycle pop into existence." Yes, yes, Doctor Craig, this is true. We never see a bicycle, but but we but that doesn't mean particle physics doesn't exist. Anyways, it could be that the the Big Bang was caused in you know naturalistic processes happen at Stars form, explode, heavy materials get made. And don't throw the fine-tuning at me argument. The fine-tuning argument is the dumbest thing you could say. Why? Because there's trillions of planets. And for there not to be one with the conditions necessary for life would actually be a stronger proof that there was an agent. Because there would have to be an agent to stop a planet from existing that would be necessary for the conditions of life. So what we see... Bayesian posterior naturalism. That's like 99.9999999999% on naturalism and 0. 0.000, like a million zeros, one on, on a god. That's just reality, but I understand it's possible. Okay, fine. So it's possible. A lot of paradoxes in there. A lot of paradoxes. So part of the process of, of X. Christians who become atheists, part of the process, not everybody, but a lot of us go through this process of, of thinking that those thoughts through. And what we think to ourselves is, gee, if this God, whether it's a Calvinist deterministic God or an open theist God or some Dr. Flowers God in the middle, in all of those cases, it's, it's true that God could have done something different to alleviate suffering. Now I know the answer is, well, he's gonna he's gonna make up for it in heaven. But according to most Christians, most in most religions, even you know, except for maybe Hindus, I guess, like you go, you get punished or rewarded based on your short time on Earth, which again just seems completely unfair. So at the end of the day, at the end of the day, not only does naturalism meet the facts that we see that that the model if we were to if we were if let's just say for a minute you could put down you could say okay let's imagine there's no god how would a universe come about and and we said let's build the model of what a natural universe would look like and we build that model we look at the math and we look at chemistry and physics answer what what we see fits that model thus the posterior, the Bayesian posterior, is atheism is is a reasonable conclusion that there's not a god. Now, if if there is a god, in order to make him to be a good, loving god, you you have to jump through a lot of hoops about why he didn't massage things so that the black plague or malaria or certain or certain earthquakes didn't happen. Like you could still have. It's like if imagine you're a parent and your kid comes to you and says, "I want to." I want to ride a bicycle, Daddy. Or I want to. Can I have, Mommy? Can I have a bicycle for my birthday? Well, what do you do? You you get a sm the appropriate bike with training wheels. You get a helmet, and you you're you're not stopping the kid's free will because you give him a helmet and you tell him he can only ride in these certain areas. I mean, you are right. You are. You are being a parent and you are stopping your kid from doing certain things. Like if the kid says, I want to ride my bike down that giant hill and into traffic. If you're a good parent, you say, no, I'm not going to let you have that libertarian free will. You're not evil Knievel. Sorry. And, and, we, and generally speaking, we say that's being a good parent, not a bad parent. It's the bad parent that just lets the kid have the bike and go play in the street by himself. That's the bad parent. But for some reason, you have a double standard when it comes to God. Because God doesn't do that. Like God just unleashes plagues and earthquakes and tidal waves. And you say, oh, well, it's, it's man's libertarian free will. That's why that four-year-old child got dysentery, malaria, and then 
you know, and then his parents died and he went to an orphanage where he was sold into slavery. That was his libertarian free will. Come on. Can we be honest, at least when we talk about this stuff? The way all of you all describe your God, he's just a sadistic, mean bastard. And you, the only way around that is special pleading. Anyways, I'm going to close this up, but I want to say one thing. I don't disbelieve in God because I hate God or because I think he's a sadistic bastard. I just, I don't believe in God based on the evidence and the paradoxes when you try to build a God model. See, when you build the naturalistic model, there's still some paradoxes about free will, which is why you have uh, the Robert and Sam's argument and the Daniel, Daniel Dennett's argument. You still have some of these paradoxes, but there you go. They're just, they don't. You don't you don't model your life after deciding which who's right. Whereas in Christianity, you have all these paradoxes. You have Christians going on YouTube, bashing each other, claiming the other guy's not even a Christian. He can't possibly love Jesus because and he's going to go to hell because he believes he's read Greg Boyd and he believes open theism, which is another interesting point, I thought. And I'm going to close with this. Imagine there's a Christian that you believe is a Christian. He has fruits of the spirit. He's a loving person. He does good works, but he's also believed. And every evidence in his life is that he's believed. He confesses with his mouth. He's been baptized. He, he goes to a good church. Like everything about his life, you say, yeah, of course, he's a brother in the Lord. He's a brother in Christ. I expect to see him in heaven. And all of a sudden he tells you, hey, I just read Greg Boyd's book and it makes a lot of sense to me. I, I, you know, I believe this is true. It, the theodicy helps me accept some of the things that I struggled with before, and I really believe. In... Are you going to say, "Heathen, atheist, you're going to hell now, or you've lost your salvation, or worse, you were never saved"? Are you really going to say that, honestly? Come on, see how silly this stuff is. All right, I'm Michael Beverly. This is it. I'm wrapping up. Please, please follow. I need to get to a thousand followers slowly inching up there please subscribe please like please share and please give me comments i appreciate them and i try to i'm still small enough i can answer most comments have a great day people